Hello, and welcome back to the Clinics Review Articles Podcasts. My name is Megan Ashdown, Clinics Editor at Elsevier, and I'm here with my colleague, Senior Clinics Editor, John Vassallo. Joining us today is Dr. Joel Heidelball, Clinical Professor of Family Medicine and Urology at the University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Eidelball serves as the consulting editor of Elsevier's primary care clinics and office practice and as the editorial advisor for our clinics collections. The clinics collections draws from Elsevier's robust clinics review articles database to provide multidisciplinary teams with practical clinical advice and insights that can be implemented in individual specialties and everyday practice. Today, we're discussing our latest edition of the clinic's collections on heart disease that published this April. So let us welcome back the editorial advisor for our clinic's collections, Dr. Joel Heidelball. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. We'll jump right into things. Uh, So let's begin with the article titled, The Risk of Sudden Unexpected Cardiac Death in Children. And that was written by Emmanuel Monda and some other authors as well. So the authors mentioned that in children, the main causes of sudden cardiac death are inherited cardiac disorders. So I'm wondering, uh, and I'm sure our audience is wondering as well, Uh, which inherited cardiac disorders could potentially lead to an unexpected death in a child? Sure. And I think this was a really important review to include in in this collection series because um, as as uncommon as many of these conditions are, um, it's easy for them to sort of be off our clinical radar and diagnostic radar. Um, But, you know, many of them are obviously very important to recognize. Many of them can be life-threatening, and obviously many of them, if if recognized early, can can be, um, there's an intervention that can be done, and, and, uh, you know, it can change outcomes. So the most common structural causes that we think of are arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, myocarditis as well, and less common structural causes include aortic disease, Congenital heart diseases, coronary artery disease is pretty rare, but still can happen, and then dilated and restrictive cardiomyopathies. Um, and then there's a number of um, causes of, that are arrhythmogenic causes, really, um, that can lead to sudden death, including Brugada syndrome, catecholamine, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, long QT syndrome, less common early repolarization syndrome, short QT syndrome and Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Um, and you know, as I as I sort of read through the list, I'm sure many of our listeners are thinking, wow, how am I supposed to pick these up or how am I supposed to be suspicious about those? Um, and we'll we'll uh, we'll think through that here in, in the next few minutes. Awesome. So as a primary care physician, I'm curious, what advice would you give to parents that have a child with one of those inherited disorders? Sure. Um, well, that's the challenge because a lot of times we don't we don't learn about these or think about these or or find out about them until uh, you know a child can be very very sick or pass out or um, uh, or or really struggle with their activities of daily living. So the advice to give parents is to really think about family history and think about risk, um, and that's something that can be easily discussed with a child's family physician or pediatrician, thinking about um, different types of heart disease in other children, adolescents, and adults throughout the family. And the questions they should really be asking the child's um, primary care provider, either family physician or pediatrician, or even cardiologist upon referral, really get at, uh, you know, what they should they be looking for? What are the symptoms? What's going to happen? Um, what can we do to try to prevent any kind of bad outcome, and uh, and what do I need to be on the lookout for? But then also, uh, especially for families uh, that that may go on to have other children, what are the risks of other children having similar syndromes? I know you just mentioned a little bit about uh, prevention. So obviously, a sudden and unexpected death is a tragedy, especially when it's a child. Could you talk a little bit more about prevention strategies? 
Sure. Um, so the authors do a great job of breaking this down in, into a couple of different categories to, to think about. Again, starting with trying to identify patients at risk um, and then trying to prevent any kind of event or primary prevention and identifying the underlying cause and implementing strategies to try to prevent any further events or secondary prevention here. And a lot of this is just really going to have to come through longitudinal care with the primary care provider and the, the child's cardiologist. But again, understanding symptoms, understanding risks, and then really getting into, um, are there any limitations that you place on the child in their activities of daily living? And you talked a little bit about uh, potential symptoms like passing out. Um, what are some of the other warning symptoms to look out for? You know, a lot of them can be very vague. Um, a lot of them can be very vague from getting winded really quickly or decreased exercise tolerance or, or you know, very astute parents saying, uh, wow, my child just isn't acting normally today. Usually they like to run around the house and play and, and, and now they're not. Or um, breathing difficulties, um, discoloration, um, child not uh, appearing well or appearing as if they don't feel well, appearing more fatigued. Um, a lot of really vague symptoms. And, and you know, in many cases, uh, we hope that those symptoms are present so that we can act on them because the risk of, of sudden cardiac death due to many of these is, is, so, um, is so great that sometimes when these things happen, uh, we may not be aware of the symptoms and, and, and things can progress. Okay, well, before we move on to the next article, thank you for all of that. Uh, do you have any other comments to add uh, about um, sudden unexpected cardiac death, especially in children? You know, I, I think this all comes down to education and screening. I think it comes down to the role of the, the primary care provider in terms of trying to uh, ask questions about um, any cardiac or cardiopulmonary symptoms, but again, a very detailed family history to try to get at assessing each uh, potential child's risk. Again, the authors did a great job on, on this review. It's very detailed. It's very timely. Uh, they talk about trying to identify underlying cause. They talk about risk stratification. Um, but then they also mention how risk stratification is very difficult uh, without cardiomyopathies or without obvious irregular um, uh, rhythms because uh, because it can be very hard to do. So I think, you know, the, the more longitudinal care is, is really important and needed uh, for children, I think that gives more of an opportunity to ask and answer these questions and thoroughly evaluate the children. Hi, Dr. Hardiball. Um, let's discuss the article Heart Healthy Diets and the Cardiometabolic Jackpot by Ormiston, Rossander, and Taub. Um, listeners have a general idea of heart-healthy diets, but which popular ones do the authors mention in their article? Well, this is a great one. Uh, I read this one several times, and I, you know, I'm still learning every time I read it. They, they do such a great job of not only summarizing the diets, but really stratifying out what key, com key components are, um, but also challenges with long-term adherence. So uh, a number of the things that they center on are the Mediterranean diet, the Ornish diet, uh, the Pritikin diet, and but they also talk about very popular diets, uh, the ketogenic diet and the paleo or the paleolithic diet. So which ones seem to have the most success? <laughs> All of them and none of them. Uh, you know, um, a lot of this is really going to be individual dependent. Um, I, you know, I think everybody wishes there was one diet and everybody could follow it and everybody would lose weight and maintain weight loss. I think there's challenges in understanding everybody's differences in metabolism and lifestyle and other medical comorbid factors that make it challenging. Um, there are a number of trials, especially for Mediterranean and Ornish and Pritikin, that really did show um, a high percent of compliance, even after five years. Um, I think people sometimes confuse the term diet with lifestyle changes and the purpose of the diet is for you to be able to make sustainable changes over time, but keep them. Um, so, you know, a lot of these can be very, very, very successful. But as the authors point out, the most successful diets are the ones that patients find the easiest to engage with, the easiest to understand, and the easiest to maintain with the support of their primary care providers. 
you know, heart healthy is the term, but what types of foods make up a heart healthy diet? And do all these diets have these heart healthy foods in them? Well, I, you know, I think the staples for many of these are plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and limiting high fat, high cholesterol foods. Um, some of them, uh, if you take a look at the Ornish diet, which is which is uh, vegetarian, it's going to really limit the fat composition. Whereas if you take a look at the paleo or the paleolithic diet, um, obviously it's it's higher in, in meat as a protein source, but um, doesn't recommend dairy or grains. And I think what's challenging about diet and probably beyond the scope of our conversation here today is really understanding the nutritional needs of an individual patient relative to their metabolism. Um, but, uh, you know, many of these can be very successful and uh, many of these can, can be adaptable for most patients. Yeah. So one of my follow-up questions was whether you recommend different diets for your patients due to their weight or age or sex or some other factors. And it seems like the short answer is yes. I do. I think the best way to take a look at these things is to individualize them. Um, you know, I, I remember conversations with patients about uh, the paleo diet, for example. And the first thing they say is, I don't really like meat. You say, well, that's probably not going to be the best diet for you. Let's take a look at another one. Or, um, you know, the Mediterranean diet that may be uh, higher in in, uh, in fish and moderate consumption of dairy products. And somebody might tell me they don't take dairy or, or, or fish. Maybe they have allergies or other food intolerances. So I think it has to be very individualized. And um, another thing that the authors really try to center focus on is uh, caloric maintenance and, and reasonable caloric intake. So are there any tips or advice you can give to fellow uh, primary care physicians on how to get more patients to eat more heart-healthy diets? Sure. So the first tip I'm, I'm going to give is uh, probably a little bit pie in the sky, but when when we're busy primary care providers, it can be very difficult to center important information um, in the context of a, of a 15 or 20 minute visit, uh, you know, where we're dealing with six or seven issues. Um, I know I'm not doing a good job when I give somebody diet information, quote unquote, on the fly. So the, the first tip would be dedicate an entire visit to um, diet, exercise strategies, obesity management, the, the whole paradigm. So tip number one is give yourself and give the patient time. Tip number two is you know, really try to solicit their knowledge coming into this because everybody's going to come into a diet discussion with some knowledge. Everyone's tried something. Most people have tried and failed. And then now they're going to come and look to us for additional guidance. So I, I think it really just takes the time to be able to solicit where patients are at, what they know, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. Uh, and then taking a look at their overall, uh, you know, cardiometabolic status and, and medical comorbidities to come up with a good option. Yeah, excellent advice. Um, the second half of the article uses the term cardiometabolic jackpot, which is a new term for me. What does that mean? And do you mention this to your patients? I, I haven't, but I'm going to steal this term. I love this term. Um, <laughs> and it's it, it makes a lot of sense. The authors do a great job of going through um, various, various uh, formulas, if you will, talking about body composition, talking about time-restricted eating, talking about um, a consistent feeding fasting cycle, which really facilitates circadian rhythm alignment. Um, we're not robots. Nobody lives on a perfect hour-to-hour -hour clock schedule. Uh, at least I don't. I think most people do. And they do a, a really intelligent job of trying to break this down that is easy to explain to patients for strategies of time-restricted eating, uh, but also folding in exercise. You know, they talk about uh, like a 16 to 8 hour kind of a model, but they also talk about how following this cardiometabolic jackpot and resetting metabolism, understanding an individual's metabolism, um, in the research has shown that in a, in a lot of studies, it increased muscle mass and reduced fat mass and total body mass. Finally, um, I guess on your personal level, can you briefly discuss the other members of your healthcare team that would be involved in your patient's nutritional health and how they work together? 
Absolutely. I don't think anybody in medicine these days can do anything or everything, I should say, by themselves. I think medicine is complex enough. And um, for a lot of our uh, a lot of our patients, I think there's um, elements of their health that require not only a lot of different visits, but a lot of different um, care team members providing input from different levels. So I know what I can do as a primary care physician in family medicine, but we also utilize our nutritionists. We also utilize um, our social workers, especially for our patients that have food insecurity. And maybe it's easy to sit there and discuss a diet with somebody, but if they don't have the means or the ability to buy reasonable foods or have access to reasonable foods, it's probably not going to be uh, very effective. So uh, engaging social work, engaging um, our nurses who are great educators, and, um, you know, depending on the medical complexity of, of patients, I'm thinking our patients with poorly controlled diabetes who uh, see uh, an endocrinologist and our patients with heart disease who see cardiologists, the list goes on. Point is, is that, um, you know, through a, a care team model, this is going to allow us better to really take a better care of a patient from a lot of different angles. Yeah, absolutely. A full team effort. Uh, so we'll move on to the next article, effects of testosterone treatment on cardiovascular health. So right away in the introduction, the authors talk about prescription rates for testosterone products rising over the years. Uh, so I'm curious, have you seen this at all in your own experience? Sure. Um, you know, if you go back, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, we knew about testosterone deficiency in aging men. We knew somewhat about its impact on cardiovascular health, but a lot of research hadn't been done. And then you fast forward a few years and a little bit of research was being done, um, especially in the early 2000s that, that took a look at cardiometabolic outcomes and showed that testosterone deficiency was correlated with uh, early death due to cardiovascular diseases. Um, and in an aging population of men, testosterone uh, declined. I think from that and other factors, especially patient inquiry about these things, um, it began to be a bit more discussed. It began to be a bit more marketable. It began to be a bit more um, customary uh, to be thought about and, uh, and tested for and, and addressed. And, and then with that, it uh, became very popular. And there's data that shows that um, prescription rates went way up. And there's data to show that uh, it was being addressed uh, much more frequently. And around that time, there was some conflicting research that came out that showed some benefit for cardiovascular health and showed substantial risk for cardiovascular health. Um, once those papers on risk came out, prescriptions tailed off a little bit um, for a variety of reasons. And then now I, I think we're in a place where it's starting to be talked about again as more research is being done. Uh, yeah, like you said, the article suggested that the medical research is inconclusive about the long-term cardiovascular safety for um, testosterone replacement therapy. So knowing that as a primary care physician, how does that affect your decision making? So once again, everything needs to be individualized. Um, the authors, who many of whom are really the leading experts in the world on this subject, um, highlighted a lot of papers that looked at benefit and, and potential risk. And one of the challenges with trying to understand benefit versus risk is you need prospective longitudinal studies over a period of time that are statistically powered to be able to assess risk. And that's morbidity and mortality outcomes from cardiovascular disease. And those, those just don't exist. There are some going on now. Um, but they, they specifically state the long-term cardiovascular safety of testosterone replacement therapy remains uncertain. Um, they, they do feel that testosterone replacement therapy should be avoided in men who have had a major adverse cardiovascular event um, in the preceding six months prior to consideration of treatment or in men with a hypercoagulable state. So I think you need to take a look again, just like anything else, it's got to be individualized. You've got to think, uh, you know, what is the cause of the testosterone deficiency? What are the related comorbidities? And what are the potential benefits of, um, of replacing uh, testosterone to a satisfactory level versus 
potential cardiovascular risk. Well, I know you're saying that it's individualized, with, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, we're all different. Uh, but what would make a patient eligible in your mind to be prescribed a testosterone product? Obviously, uh, a reduced amount of testosterone, but um, sounds like if they had some issues with a heart in the past, that would be out of the question. Yeah, if a, if a man has a known coronary artery disease or a history of a cardiovascular event, I, I, I would feel that they would not be a candidate. Um, the studies that show concern were conducted mostly in men who received testosterone replacement therapy and had underlying cardiovascular disease and or events, and, and the mortality risk was, was greater. So for the patients in my mind who are eligible, uh, you know, we, the best ones, we, we follow the guidelines, the endocrinology guidelines, the American Urological Association guidelines, and you try to get a sense of what the cause of testosterone deficiency is to determine if there's, if there's a way that um, that can be mitigated before replacing the testosterone or really, again, just looking at, at, at risks and, and benefits relative to outcomes. Um, we see a lot of men who have un, other endocrinopathies, diabetes, thyroid disease. We see a lot of men who have a lot of um, obese status, visceral adiposity, um, poorly controlled diabetes. Um, you know, in many, in many cases, um, you know, those, those men coupled with symptoms of decreased stamina, erectile dysfunction, decreased libido, perhaps mood changes, things like that, uh, may be benefit. But I think everybody really needs to be watched uh, very closely and, and obviously monitored. And last question before we move on to, to the last article. When would you refer your patient to an endocrinologist and, and how would you work together to ensure your patient's cardiovascular health? Sure. Um, the answer to that is I think it really depends on the, the level of comfort of the primary care provider. Um, there's, there's a lot of folks who feel comfortable in hormone management, and there's a lot of folks who may not. Um, I know endocrinologists who don't necessarily engage in a lot of testosterone replacement therapy. I know endocrinologists who do. Um, I would say that also holds true for urologists. So I think it's about level of comfort based upon the individual practitioner, but I also think it's about a collaborative effort. If I was going to re refer a patient to endocrinology, um, I'd want to work closely with them, and I think they're going to need to understand the full picture of the patient, uh, again, relative to, to cardiometabolic risk. Um, and, you know, I would also throw cardiology in, into that discussion. Um, for for patients who may stand some benefit from testosterone replacement therapy, but also may have some unmitigated cardiovascular risk. For our listeners, uh, this clinics collection actually has over 20 articles, but we're just discussing four of them. And the final article is by doctors Fedson and Boskert on telehealth and heart failure. Uh, they write, quote, telehealth can be largely divided into three areas clinician to clinician communication, the patient interacting with mobile health technologies, and lastly, clinician patient interaction, unquote. So uh, let's take each one individually. How does telehealth work for clinician clinician communication? Sure. So, you know, telehealth has been, been a really, really interesting invention. Um, there are places that were doing this before the pandemic, and I think the pandemic really threw us into it out of necessity for caring for our patients at a time when it was it was much more challenging to do. I think the bigger health systems and health networks are, the more complicated it is for everyone to communicate. However, with an electronic medical record, it in a lot of ways has become a lot easier. Um, you know, in managing patients a number of years ago, I either didn't hear from my specialty colleagues or eventually I got something in the mail from them. You know, um, now with, with telehealth for clinician to clinician communication, things are a lot more real time. Things are a lot more streamlined. Um, and I think that communication really enhances the benefit of the outcomes of the patients. Yeah. Much quicker communication too, right? Definitely. Instantaneous. Definitely. Mm -hmm. 
The next area is uh, patient interaction with mobile health technologies. Of course, there's plenty of those, but what types of remote monitoring specific to heart disease do you work with? You know, it ranges from uh, devices that, that patients wear on their wrists um, that manage, or I shouldn't say manage, that monitor pulse, uh, heart rhythm, blood pressure, a variety of different uh, cardiac um, uh, vital signs, if you will. And many of those mobile health technologies now have the capability of transmitting that data directly to the electronic medical record. And we, we see this with, with cardiology. We see this with diabetes, patients checking their finger sticks at home. But the ability to have a patient have a device uh, that interacts with their medical record allows them to send that data directly to the clinician and the clinician's healthcare team. And that, that can improve management. And how do these patients handle these technologies? Is there a learning curve to these? There is. Um, I have some patients who are, you know, fantastically savvy with this. And I've got patients who are engineers that create graphs and come in and show me calculus and how they've interpreted their own data that that is several levels above me, <laughs> many levels above me. And, uh, and then I, I have patients uh, that, that struggle with it. You know, um, I think... You know, perhaps my academic setting is a bit unique because I, I probably have uh, more resources than others to be able to have nurses and educators uh, work with patients to try to teach them how to use some of these devices and upload information. Um, so I'd say there's definitely a learning curve, but I, I think as these things advance, the intuitiveness and the ease of use will, will continue to also advance and, uh, and, and hopefully be seamless. And finally, the last area of telehealth is the most well-known one, especially since the pandemic, and that's the clinician-patient interaction. And how have you seen it evolve over the years? Is it still growing or plateauing, or what, what, what are your thoughts now? Sure. Uh, you know, during, the, during certain parts of the pandemic, it was, it was all we had, or, or almost all we had. Um, and, and, and then as that uh, uh, epidemiologic curve went up and down relative to COVID cases in our, in our various areas, that really dictated how many patients we were seeing in clinics or um, uh, how and when we could see them, really. And so, again, we use telehealth, either video visits or telephone visits or um, or, or patients communicating with healthcare portals to get us data and information to be able to find a way to take care of them. Um, and it really, it really happened out of necessity. I think the learning curve was steep. I think the boom was steep. Uh, we fortunately now are in a place where we're seeing more in-person appointments. Um, but I think it's here to stay. I think the clinician-patient interactions over virtual care and telehealth Initially, we're tough. I, I'll, I'll totally admit at the beginning, I think we did it out of necessity, but I became a skeptic to some point because, uh, you know, maybe I'm old school, but I wanted to be able to see a patient and listen to their heart and measure their vitals. And immediately, if you're talking about heart failure and other, other heart conditions and you take away the ability to do all of that, you start to question how well you can actually take care of somebody. But um, with devices and, and with patients, um, being able to check blood pressures at home or check some vitals at home, or it's not uncommon. I'll be on the phone with someone or, or video visit with someone, and, and I'm trying to manage their, their volume status so that they don't go into heart failure exacerbation. And I'm talking to them about their diuretic dose, and I'll tell them, tell you what, go step on the scale, come back, tell me what you weigh today. And, and Maybe that's a maybe that's an easier way that they don't have to come to the office all the time, and we can do uh, some less acute care for maintenance at home that keeps people out of the ERs and and the hospitals. And so I think those elements are here to stay. I think the ability for patients to collect that type of data, transmit that type of data, have various levels of interactions with providers and provider care teams uh, is is really fantastic. And the authors highlight that. Yeah, I'd say it's definitely here from a patient perspective like me, it, it's here to stay. <laughs> we use it all the time. Um, so finally, I guess, are there any other points you wanted to make about this article or the issue overall? Yeah, um, you know, two things, really. Um, 
One, especially for our patients with moderate to advanced heart failure, um, I think these hybrid models of care, including telehealth, will continue to evolve. And and that's going to fit a a role not only for routine office visits, but uh, more acute office visits and even post-discharge and post-hospital follow-up visits. Um, You know, I think we've proven not every patient needs to be seen in person. Uh, and I think that that makes it easier for the patient and, and um, may make it easier on our end as well. And the other point I was going to make is I know healthcare systems are going to struggle with how to best invest in these technologies, um, whether it's equipment or connectivity or portals or, or what have you. But I think we also have to be astute about thinking about um, healthcare disparities and hopefully mitigating this issue in a sense that it can reduce disparities and and not widen that gap. I think that might be the next issue of the clinics collection is health disparities. We've been discussing it a lot and I publishing a lot on it. And I think it'd be a great collection and a great podcast. I'd love to do it. Well, thank you, Joel. Really appreciate it uh, as always. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Clinics Review Articles podcast on heart disease with Dr. Joel Heidelbaum. To purchase this clinic's collection on heart disease or other recent editions on COVID, telehealth, or addiction medicine, please visit us.elsevierhealth.com. For more information on the Clinics Review Article program, which spans nearly 60 medical specialties, visit www.theclinics.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Clinics Reviews and subscribe to the Clinics Review Articles podcast on Apple Music, Google Play, Amazon Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thanks for listening.